So now, the true story of the origin of the world's most loved data interchange format, the JSON data. So, uh, I discovered things. I don't really invent things, but I discovered things. Uh, one of my most important discoveries was that JavaScript has good parts. This was the first important discovery of the 21st century. At the time that I asked my findings, people just couldn't believe that there was anything good about JavaScript at all. But in fact, it's been borne out. It actually has very good parts. But that was a talk for another time. Instead, I'm going to talk about where Jason came from. So I started a company in 2001 called Mail Networks. And we were doing what today you would call Ajax frameworks. And we needed a way of moving data between the browser and the server. And we, um, looked at a number of things. We invented a couple of things of our own. Uh, we looked at XML and said, well, that's just terrible. Um, and then one day I had this epiphany that JavaScript object rules, that's the format we should be using. I mean, it's perfect. It, it, JavaScript understands it, and it exactly represents the data. Um, our server was written in Java. It had a very easy time communicating with JavaScript um, using JSON. Um, and we used it for other things on the server side, server communication, um, as a simple database, things that had nothing to do with JavaScript. So we were uh, pretty excited about it. We talked to some of our customers about how we were using JSON, and they said, well, we can't use that because it's not a standard. So I decided I needed to make it standard. So I became a standards body. Um, and I published it as a JSON data exchange format. Um, so I discovered JSON. I do not claim to have invented JSON because it already existed in nature. All I did was identify it, give it a name, describe how it could be used. I don't claim to be the first person to have uh, discovered it. Um, I discovered it in 2001. I've met other people who were using it in 2000. The earliest use I found of using JavaScript in data communication was in 1996 at Netscape. So what I did was I gave the specification and a little website one-page website which described um, the format. And the rest happened by itself. There was no industry mechanism to promote JSON. Um, it just happened by itself because a lot of people discovered it was useful. One of my goals in the design of JSON was that it be minimal. Um, on the theory that the less we need to agree on, the easier it is to draw. So I uh, deliberately made the specification of JSON as simple and as small as possible. Uh, this is uh, Google Trends from uh, a day or two ago, comparing um, search volumes for JSON versus XML. Um, you can see that XML is clearly trending down, and, X, and JSON is trending up. I can't predict where the intersection is going to happen, um, but clearly um, it's inevitable. So um, uh, there's XML and all that stuff. Um, XML happened basically because of HTML. HTML was a huge simplification uh, over SGML, which was an earlier time in format. Um, at the time that HTML was introduced, there were a lot of technologists who said, this is not a good hypertext system. It's deficient in a whole lot of ways. And it turns out they were right, and we were still struggling with all those deficiencies. Um, but a lot of people who didn't understand those limitations adopted HTML. Um, so, um, a lot of technologists then decided that they had asked the wrong question. They shouldn't be asking if a new technology is good enough. They shouldn't be asking, is it, could it be popular enough? And so when XML came out, they asked, can it be popular enough? And it looked like, yeah, it probably could. Um, John C. Lee Brown was the guy who ran Xerox Park, which was one of the greatest research labs in the world. They invented overlapping windows and um, Ethernet laser printers, and a whole lot of stuff that we take for granted today. Um, at the CTO forum in San Francisco in 2002, he was talking about a new architecture for the web that he imagined in which he's got loosely coupled systems interacting um, using XML as the data interchange. And he uh, said, maybe only something this simple could work. A few months later, I was at another conference where another speaker who was much closer to the ground, was talking about his work with XML, and he said, maybe only something this complicated would work. I thought it was really interesting that it went from something that was so simple to something that was so complicated in just a couple of months. 
Um, there are other people who noticed it too. For example, there was a popular website called XML Sucks on uh, uh, The premise of that site was that XML was technologically terrible, but you had to use it anyway because it was the standard. Um, uh, so uh, XML is a standard, so shut up, shut up. Uh, but not everybody shut up. There were some um, cranks who saw that there were obvious problems with XML, and they all set out to try to correct them. So um, this is a list that was created by a guy named Paul of XML alternatives that people can propose. Um, each of these correctly identified at least one problem in XML and solved it. Um, but if you ask any inventor of any of these if he would drop his word in favor of another one, they would say no. So this was not any kind of community. There was no way they were ever going to get a consensus on So this would have just been an ever-growing list of cranks. Uh, but the thing that changed was Ajax. When Ajax was discovered, um, the X in Ajax was supposed to be for XML. Uh, but the smart kids very quickly discovered that XML wasn't going to work. And so they went looking for an alternative. And so Jason uh, floated to the top of this list. And the reason for that was Jason was the only one of these alternatives that was designed specifically for doing Ajax. And so it was a perfect fit. Um, James Clark was one of the architects of XML after he became aware of Jason and how it worked. Declared that any damn fool could produce a better data format than XML. Which it turns out is true. <coughs> so somehow in all the XML um, hysteria, we forgot one of the first principles of craftsmanship is that you have to use the right tool for the right job. Simply because something is a standard doesn't mean it's the right choice. So Jason did nothing except to remind us that we get to choose the best tool. In fact, we are responsible to choose the best tool. You know, that, that's a huge benefit. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Jason logo. When I created the, the one-page website for Jason, I decided it should have a logo on it in order to look official. And so I created this thing. Um, it was inspired by a famous optical illusion called the Impossible Forest, which is closely related to and the helical hex map. So I took the impossible forest and I turned it around and I made it circular um, and I gave it some dramatic shape. And um, I kind of liked that um, if you look at it two dimensionally, it's made of two identical pieces which go together and form a circle. Um, so that suggested to me the conversation of uh, the protocol over the network that it was originally intended to, to form. Um, data going back and forth. Um, it also has some letter forms hidden in it. Like you can see the J there on the side, there's an O obviously, and maybe an N. I haven't found the S yet, but I'm pretty sure it's in there somewhere. And after looking at this for a couple of years, uh, one day I suddenly realized that it's not an optical illusion, it's not an impossible shape, it's actually a simple shape. You can take a, um, a square and screw it in a circle. And as it orbits, you have to do half a revolution. And when you do that, that that's what you get. You know, so it's, it's a real thing. It, it's not impossible, it's simple. Which is a really nice metaphor for Jason. Um, um, data interchange, we can't believe in. Now, it turns out, uh, I thought I, I invented this, but I didn't. Um, it um, actually occurs much earlier. It was uh, developed by Saul Bass, and you can see it in this uh, movie poster he made for Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Um, Bass also did the um, opening uh, title sequence of the film, which begins uh, with a camera tracking over a woman's face and uh, coming up to her eye, and then this thing appears over her eye, and then we kind of zoom into it, and we zoom into many levels of these swirling uh, lucid juice spirals. Um, the spirals were created by um, early computer graphics pioneer named um, John Whitney um, using a modified bomb site that he reconfigured as an optical analog computer. Um, this uh, opening sequence was the first use of computer graphics we ever had in motion pictures. And it was really amazing to be moving into computer graphics in the film. Um, this inspired 2001 and a whole lot of other stuff. Later. And apparently, this 
inspired me. My parents took me to the drive-in to see this movie when I was five, and I really liked the title sequence, and I didn't really care about the rest of the movie. Um, so I was surprised to find that it actually made such an impression on me that I, uh, I ripped it off many years later, not even knowing something. Um, one of the benefits of JSON being so simple is that the standard can be described literally on one page. It's a very simple page. So because it's so simple, it's not much work to translate it into other languages. In fact, uh, many people have contributed um, uh, translations uh, to JSON.org that they don't know the standard. So if anybody here is fluent in a language which isn't on this list, I imagine it must be somebody, uh, and you'd like to help out, um, I, I would very much appreciate that. Um, the uh, most popular uh, implementation of, of JSON and JavaScript is in a library called JSON.2. Um, JSON.2 is um, also in the next version of the standard in, in uh, the script fifth edition. Uh, and it's now in almost all the major web browsers. It's not in IE 6 or 7, but it's in everything else. Um, so if you're using uh, JSON2.js, um, and you're on a newer browser, it gets out of the way and everything runs much faster. Um, so I, uh, the file was available on JSON.org, uh, and one day um, my uh, hosting service called me and said, I had way too much load, but they're going to cut me off if I didn't fix it. Um, so I looked at the logs and I couldn't find anything unusual. Um, I looked at the, the reports, but when I looked at the logs, the logs were huge, and it, it took a long time to spend and it turned out there was a website called onlinebootycall.com that was hot making to its file. And um, I had never heard of it before, but apparently they were really popular because um, they were happening on my server. Um, so I didn't know how to get a hold of them. So I added an alert to the first line of the file, which said, remove this line before the point. Um, so if you went to onlinebootycall.com, you would see this. Um, they very quickly uh, had, um, and fixed it. Um, Steve Sowers uh, wrote about this on, on his blog, and they posted a reply to see if you guys were right or our engineers had pulled the bail. Um, so that, that was nice. So um, by doing that, I helped online booty call uh, improve the performance of their website because by not loading, by loading the file out of their server rather than mine, they say the DNS will a lot of other things, so um, everybody got it better. So then it happened again. Um, I had another file, JSON.AS, which was um, an obsolete action script file that was still on the JSON network site, and I was getting hammered by some um, uh, BitTorrent site. I couldn't be sure where it was, but it was like right in Russia or someplace, and I was getting hammered. It was just, uh, it was bigger than online booty call. Um, so I find what to do, I also put the alert in that file. No effect, and in fact the man kept going up. Oh, well, this, this is pretty bad. Um, so you know, I tried to alert them to get their attention, that didn't work, so I deleted the file. Um, and it turned out that uh, for my server, doing a 404 is more work than doing a 200, so it was actually making things worse, and the man still kept going up. So I'm telling you, well, this is, you know, I, I don't know what to do about this. Um, you know, so one of the reasons why you shouldn't be loading um, script files from other sites is somebody can go and handle with the file, and, you know, like I was doing, and do terrible things like uh, you know, uh, steal your user's identities or, or redirect to a different site. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll redirect them to another site. Where should I redirect them to? Um, so I thought, well, I'll send them to the FBI. Probably pirates, and so that, that was scary. That should get their attention. No, they didn't pay any attention. Uh, and then a day later, all of my websites were down. So I called up my service provider, and they said that um, somehow some hackers had gotten into my system and used it to launch a denial of service attack against the federal government of the United States. <laughs> and so I was shot down in the investigation. So I, I had to explain, you know, I'm sorry, I did that, but it wasn't productive, it wasn't malicious, I was just trying to, I didn't mean to attack the United States government, really sorry, we got fixed. Um, so I got the site up, and I'm still getting hammered now. So for the, the days that um, I was off the air, 
and promotes evil. All projects on uh, Google Code must be in that role for evil purpose. Uh, so it's really strange how um, there's this religion in some corners of the open source community uh, which are completely opposed to restriction on evil. Um, and I don't understand that because I don't like evil. Evil is bad. Um, and even though I can't do anything about it, I'd like to at least be able to say so. Um, they think that I'm making fun of their religion. Um, and, and I am, you know, because I'm arrogant and, and that's what I do. Uh, they think that I've had my joke um, and that I should um, go back to uh, one of their licenses. Um, but it's not a joke, I'm serious. I don't like evil. And I believe that as a software developer, giving free stuff to the world, I should have the right to at least suggest that it not be used for your purposes. The story had a bad ending. Just in the HP moved to GitHub. GitHub apparently is not an evil corporation and they allow software to, to be hosted there um, for free um, for good. So, hooray for GitHub. Um, finally, I'd like to get on a note. Um, yeah, I use 6 plus 5. Yeah, I was here. I use 6. Oh, 
way that any of those um, components can defend itself from the other things on the page. And, and so any guest code you write onto your page gets all of the benefits and privileges of the record. And um, you know, the cross-site scripting hazards and all those things are bad. In fact, the fact that they call cross-site scripting a problem, cross-site scripting is desirable. It's what we want to do. We want to be able to have some script from lots of places working well with it, but because the browser didn't anticipate that, uh, we view that as a security hazard instead, and it's a real hazard. Um, we are fixing it at Yahoo uh, with a uh, product that uh, was developed at Google called Kaha. Kaha is a JavaScript and JavaScript translator, which turns JavaScript into um, more JavaScript, a lot more JavaScript, which has a lot of introduction and runtime to make sure that third-party code is not getting out of hand. Um, and that allows us to, to have partners and, and, and contributors put more stuff onto our site. And that's a really good thing. But it comes at a huge penalty. Uh, we pay a performance penalty for Kaha and a huge developer convenience uh, cost because not all programs can work in Kaha, so there's an adjustment. And the program you're debugging is not going to uh, fortunately, in AppleScript Fifth Edition, there's a new feature called Script Code. Um, and Script Code repairs some of the worst security problems in the language, not all of them, but some of the big ones. Um, so, having Kaha with Script Code, uh, Kaha doesn't need to do transformations anymore. It can simply do static validation. And that is enough to ensure us that third party code is safe and can run on the network full speed without them. So, that's a really good thing. The problem is that ID9 did not come. That was one of the features they decided to leave out. So that means the future doesn't start until ID9 finally gets a complete implementation of MSRF 5, which happily is going to happen in ID10. ID10 finally got it right. So um, it implements the entire language, and it goes pretty fast. And, and uh, my measurement of its performance in real applications um, it is the second fastest JavaScript engine in the world right after the, um, the canary edition of V8. Uh, so that's good news. Um, and on that good news, thank you, Daniel.